All right, guys, welcome to the Germanic Society in Charlemagne lecture. Okay, now <clears throat> we were talking about Rome and the decline of Rome, and something that was kind of skipped over is Rome becomes so big, and you guys can see how far it stretches all the way from Portugal, Spain, all the way you know, down to North Africa area. It becomes so big that it becomes hard to control, so they split it. In the two, okay, uh, West Rome, Western Roman Empire, and the Eastern Roman Empire, okay, with their two capitals, um, Rome and Constantinople. So it becomes very, very big, hard to control, so they figure if they split it in half, it'll become easier to control and safeguard. However, uh, Germanic tribes are going to come in and Rome's going to see a lot of invasions which is going to weaken them. You know, when you become so big it's hard to control, hard to protect, and you're going to be open to invasions. All right. Something you need to know about these Germanic tribes and people, they really value extended family. Okay, family is huge to them. And when I talk extended family, I'm talking about husbands, wives, children, brothers, sisters, cousins, grandparents, all together always working together okay and the two thing that these families provided for each other were land and protection okay they would work the land together and they'd pass it down to future generations so everybody would get a chunk of the land you know as as one person died they'd leave the land to this person or to their children and it would get split up but this also provided protection in violent times you have a really huge group of people able to protect themselves if ever invaded. All right. Crime and punishment. Now, between the Romans and the Germanic tribes, uh, crime was seen differently. Okay, uh, The Roman system, crime was considered an, an offense against society or the state. Okay, For someone to commit a crime in Rome, um, it was more looked at as you were hurting the collective all. Okay. Um, in the Germanic law, though, an injury by one person could lead to a blood feud. And a blood feud is where if you hurt my family, then we're going to come back and hurt your family, okay? In Germanic law, it was looked at as very personal, okay? Not, not as something that harms society or the state as a whole, but more it was a personal deal. And so if you hurt one of my family members, I would come back and hurt you. All right, and so this revenge back and forth kind of situation where maybe, you know, it's going to take a lot of bloodshed in order for it to stop. All right, part of Germanic law is what we call a word guild, okay? And that is the amount paid by a wrongdoer to the family of the person he or she has injured or killed. Okay, so pretty much you're putting the value of a person in money. Um, and how much you had to pay varied according to your social class. So if you were higher up on the totem, if you killed someone higher up on the totem pole or social structure, um, you would have to pay more money. However, if you killed somebody on the lower uh, part of the social structure, you wouldn't have to pay as much. Okay. Um, this word guild, though, it's not too uncommon from things that we do today. Think about this. If I get into a car accident, um, and I injure somebody, and it's, you know, I cause the car accident, and I injure somebody, uh, they have to go to the hospital. They can sue me. I can be found guilty of causing the accident. And if they sue me, then I have to pay their medical bills. So, you know, this word go, we call it, you know, insurance or, you know, civil case, court cases. Um, not too uncommon of things that we do today, All right? Another thing uh, they would do is a trial by ordeal, okay? This is based on the idea of divine intervention, okay? You'd be put on trial, some sort of physical trial, okay? And something bad would be would happen to you. You know, they'd hold a red-hot iron to you, okay? And it was believed that if you were innocent, that the gods wouldn't allow for you to be hurt, all right? So if I take a red-hot piece of metal and I stick it to your skin if it burns and scars you, okay, then clearly you're guilty because if you were innocent, the gods would intervene and stop that from happening. Um, if you kind of think back to uh, 
early American history with the Salem Witch Trials, you know, same thing going on there. If I dunk you under water and you're not a witch, then you should, you know, be able to live through this. But if you're a witch, then you'll drown kind of thing. Um, doesn't really make a lot of sense, you know. If, if I stick something hot burning to you, it's, it's going to burn you. Um, but they believe that, you know, if you're innocent, the gods would intervene on your side and stop you from being hurt. Okay, um, what's law and order like today? Okay, um, you know, we have laws to protect people. Okay, and how is that kept? You know, how do you keep people from hurting other people? Or how do you stop people from harming or taking away from other people? Um, and so with our system, you know, if you steal something from somebody, you have to, you know, you're going to get in trouble, you're going to have to pay a fine, and you're going to have to pay restitution. This restitution is money given back to the family to replace the thing that you stole, just kind of like a war guild, you know. Or my example before, if I'm in a car accident and I break someone's leg, I'm going to be liable to pay for the uh, medical expenses to pay, or to pay for the, to fix the broken leg, okay? <clears throat> All right, Charlemagne. All right, Charlemagne, or also known as Charles the Great, he's going to come into power. All right, he's going to be, he's kind of the the emperor or king of the Carolinian Empire, going to become emperor of Rome, even though Rome has kind of collapsed, or has actually collapsed. Okay, but he's got a lot of important qualities about him, right? Highly intelligent and curious, always looking to learn. All right, he's a lifetime learner. He's a fierce warrior, so he's really good at military um, issues and combat. Strong statesman, really knows how to control things and keep things together. All right, and another characteristic of him is he's Christian, okay? Uh, Christianity spread throughout the Roman Empire, spread throughout the area in uh, Europe. It's really taken a hold, okay? He's going to rule from 768 to 814, and we're talking CE, not CE here, Common Era. Uh, so, you know, he's got 46 years uh, of ruling, and during this time, the Frankish kingdom is going to expand into the Carolinian Empire, and it's going to be very big, okay? He's eventually going to become emperor of Rome, as I said all right so his power he's going to grow into the most powerful christian ruler and then eight in 800 common era he's going to be crowned the roman em emperor even though it's 300 years after the collapse of western roman empire um and this is really going to symbolize the coming together of roman christian and germanic elements all into one okay he's a germanic king is going to be crowned emperor of Rome by the Pope, the highest spiritual leader uh, in Christianity. All right, so you can see this kind of blending together. This Germanic king going to be crowned emperor of Rome, all right, by the highest uh, Christian uh, spiritual leader. All right, as I said, he's a lifetime learner or a lover of learning. He was a supporter of learning in huge ways, okay? He provided educated clergy for the church and uh, literate officials for the government because in order to get things done, you should probably have people who can read and write um, government laws, rules, and procedures, all right? And because he's such a lover of learner and he's providing these educated people and these people who know how to read and write, it kind of leads to this revival of learning and culture Okay, people really seeing the importance in learning and, you know, knowing how to read and write and it becomes part of the culture and everybody starts to do it. It's just not a few, you know, it's not the higher ups on the social structure. It starts to be passed to everybody. All right, um, this is also going to lead to a growth of monasteries. Okay, monasteries is, are places where uh, monks live, study, pray, okay. Um, and what monks begin to do is copy manuscripts, all right? The Bible, as well as uh, Latin classical authors, are going to be written down by these guys. So they're going to take their one single copy and 
write it out by hand, this is the only way to do it back then, and make multiple, multiple copies of the Bible, okay? So if more people can read and write, um, and I, you know, and I reprint or rewrite the Bible over and over and over, that's more people who can have the Bible in their hand, and that's an easier way for them to spread their religion, all right? And this is going to be also important in uh, preserving ancient legacies, you know, of those uh, philosophers, okay? This is going to be a way of spreading their ideas. The writing room um, are going to be called uh, scriptorias, okay? And this is where they go and write everything down and copy everything. So in this picture, you're literally looking at the very first copy machine, okay? And it was all done by hand, so think about having that job. Following the death of Charlemagne, okay, the Carolinian Empire is going to be divided between his grandsons. Uh, and this is huge because if you split one large thing that you're able to control efficiently into smaller factions, um, essentially they're not united together and so it's going to make them weaker and then they're going to start to have invasions in the 9th and 10th century, right, which is going to further weaken the empire. You're going to have Muslims attacking the southern coast of Europe, all right, sent raiding parties into southern France. Magyars from Western Asia are going to move into Central Europe and settle in Hungary and invaded Western Europe. And then you have Norsemen or the Vikings from Scandinavia invading, and these are some pretty fierce people. You really didn't want to mess with these Vikings. Okay, so you can kind of see the, the arrows. You have the Vikings from Scandinavia coming into uh, Eng what is nowadays England and Ireland and then down into France. Okay, all these arrows are representing different people. You know, the green arrows are Arab invasions from the south, uh, North Norsemen invasions from the, or Norman invasions. Okay. Now the Vikings, they sacked villages and towns, destroyed churches, and easily defeated local armies. These are some pretty fierce people, right? Uh, there are warriors, great shipbuilders, and sailors, okay? They didn't have ginormous ships as we like to think of like explorers and such uh, at this time, okay? They had what we, they called long ships, right? They weren't like massively tall or big. They were long and then kind of shallow. So they could go into shallow areas such as rivers and that allowed them to snake further inland and attack uh, inland more. And so they're able to take over not just the coast. They didn't just land on a beach and work from the beach forward. They were able to snake up those rivers and attack towns as they went. And that would allow them to, you know, take over a larger area. Um, they're so fierce and so good at what they do that eventually the ruler of the Western Frankish Kingdom, uh, which is, you know, part of France, they actually gave a piece of northern France to them, okay, to the Norsemen, which they will name Normandy. And Normandy was, will come up in World War II, uh, if you know your uh, World War II history, okay. And this kind of leads to the conversion of Vikings into European civilization. So they bring, they get introduced to some new culture. They introduce their culture and things kind of blend. And they start to, you know, uh, do things differently and do them according to the European civilization or uh, society that was there. And that's the end of the lecture. Thank you.